what I want to do today is start off quickly. I've got mm, 25 to 30 minutes maybe of a presentation on the optics basics, talking about what's important, why you want to select optics um, that we're going to kick off. And then the second half of the seminar is going to be just straight up Q&A and um, talking to our group of panelists and experts that we've got not only as panelists up here, but there's a number of uh, optics experts in our group of participants as well. We had registrations from over nine countries uh, the last I checked, so could be um, quite a quite a diverse crowd. I see Guatemala in the house. I see Newfoundland in the house. Uh, the Netherlands represented. We've got the UK, Italy uh, represented, among others. So I think what we'll do is I'll start with the presentation now. Um, and like I say, we'll go through a little bit of this. As you have questions along the way, ask them. But probably what we'll do is get to the Q&A after just the presentation. Um, I think it'd be a little easier. This is our first in our webinar series. So it's a bit of a trial and error for us too. So feel free and um, bear with us, but hopefully we'll get through this and all hopefully get all of our questions answered. All right. So with that said, we'll start you off uh, first by telling you a little bit about us and about the COA brand. If you're not familiar with COA Sporting Optics, uh, we deliver products to help you enjoy your um, natural times, your, your times outside. Uh, we have, a, of course, a huge line of spotting scopes larger than any manufacturer and all the accessories that you need um, to be able to utilize uh, your cameras and digital devices behind those scopes to capture the moments that you're um, experiencing in the field. So, We've got that and all our binoculars as well. But today, like I said, we're going to start off with some of the building blocks. And um, we're going to start with um, a little bit about COA. COA is a, a big company. Um, we have a lot more. Um, we have birds in the background. I love it. All right. All right. Um, COA. Um, it's a large company. We're into a lot of things beyond just sporting optics. Uh, from, you know, we're in the fields of the pharmaceutical field, life sciences, uh, textiles, information technologies. Um, we've been around for a long time, since 1894. Uh, we employ 3,500 worldwide employees. COA is a third generation family owned business, and it's the third largest privately owned company in Japan. So, as you might imagine, uh, with all those things going on, we cast a large global footprint, um, as you can see here with 40 international business hubs around the world. Most importantly, as it relates to sport optics, however, we want to let people know that uh, we're an environmentally conscious company. Um, COA as a brand is passionate about the environment. Uh, we're not just a company that makes products for it, but we're passionate about the use of those products and we care about the environment. And you can see that in our packaging, when you buy a COA Sporting Optics product and you open it up and you see it's all recycled cardboard, not a lot of styrofoam and plastics in there. Um, also, within our products, you know, the use of our eco glass, it's a very environmentally friendly process. Uh, and the glass itself is devoid of a lot of heavy uh, metals like lead and other things that can be harmful to the environment. So we're passionate about the environment. We want it to be around a long time so that we can appreciate it. And, uh, you know, our children and grandchildren will be able to as well. But that's it for commercial. Um, now I'm going to go straight into some of the optical principles um, that you may need uh, or be interested in to know. I want to start with some of the basics uh, to include the basic parts and components that make up the various optical products. So as we're speaking about these things, you understand what it is we're talking about. This will be review for a lot of you, I'm sure. Um, but I think you need to start at the basics and build on the foundation. So with no further ado, let's talk about a binocular and the common parts of a binocular um, that all should have. Yeah, most binoculars are gonna have a focus knob and certainly probably any binocular that you wanna be using for nature use will have a focus knob that allows you to be able to focus at different points from very near 
to infinity. So you can see everything like a, a butterfly at your feet all the way out to the stars um, and galaxies and planets that are you know millions of miles away and everywhere in between. A lot of older binoculars didn't accommodate close focus. And so they have like um, just, they set to infinity and you can't see anything closer than 60 feet. Every binocular has some sort of a central axis, also sometimes referred to as a central hinge pin upon which the two barrels are connected. It's the foundation of the binocular. Um, it allows the barrels to kind of rotate in or out to be able to get, um, to spread them or get them closer so that they match um, and are centered on your eye so you can see well through a binocular. Uh, at the fat end of the binocular, the part that's further away from your house is the objective lens cell. And I call it a cell, it's not a single lens, but uh, a number of lens elements. Uh, in Koa's case, uh, we almost invariably use an apochromat lens system in the objective lens cell. And it's a fancy term, basically means there's three separate lens elements in our objective lens cell. And it's a, a system that is mechanically good for helping to eliminate what we call chromatic aberration or color fringing, which we'll touch on in just a bit. Similarly, on the part that you put your eye against, it's known as the ocular or the eyepiece. And again, it's a series of lens elements. This is where your magnification happens. It can be as many as five, um, typically, uh, lens elements in the eyepiece. And there's a lot of bending of light that occurs to uh, accommodate the, the power of magnification. That's where that's going to happen up front there. The eyepiece itself is surrounded by an eye cup that can rotate up and down. Um, and again, this is to help you get the proper distance between the lens in your eye and the lens in the binocular. And we can talk about that a little bit as well. And then finally, uh, we have a diopter assembly. The diopter adjustment is slaved to the right barrel. And what it is, is a separate control for focus um, that is just in the right barrel. And, and in that way, you focus the system to your left eye, and then you adjust the right eye using the diopter um, to match that. We have a, a video. I'm not going to play it right now because I want to get to your Q&A, but there is a video on our um, COA YouTube page, and you can see the link there at the bottom. It's youtube.com user uh, backslash COA Sporting Optics. And we have literally like 100 plus videos. That's me sitting in my kitchen telling you how to set a diopter. Um, we're going to move past that though. Okay. Talk about the types of binoculars. There's a couple different types of industrial designs when you're looking at a binocular. The first is called the poroprism design. Poroprisms are characterized by the fact that the objective lens cell um, is not lined up with the eyepiece. And as you can see here, um, the eyepiece and the objective lens cell are not in a straight line with one another or offset. There's a dog leg in there. And you can see why if you follow on the right barrel, the path of light um, comes in the objective cell, that little dashed line with the arrows comes up into the first prism. It bounces twice at 90 degrees, drops down into the lower prism, bounce twice, and then back out the eyepiece. So as you can see here, poro prism, hopefully, uh, and a roof prism on the right side where the eyepiece and objective lens are completely lined up. Poro prism, uh, light is reflected four times, 90 degree angles. There's almost no light loss. Um, they tend to be a simpler system and uh, generally are less expensive than comparable roof prism. Roof prism by comparison, um, is going to be a little more expensive because it requires more precision uh, in developing because you have five bounces of light and you need additional coatings to be able to deliver near 100% um, of the light through the prism. Uh, the big advantages of a roof over a poro is generally speaking, they're a little bit smaller. They tend to be a little more ergonomic because they're, they're not as wide and offset um, as the poro prism design. Uh, arguably more stylish and lighter, but they do tend to be more durable because the um, uh, prism assembly is closer together. It's not as widespread, so um, easier to hold together, but they are more expensive, everything else being equal. This is uh, just a closer example of one of our prisms. I'm not going to talk about it, except for the fact that you can see that the light path, if you follow it, bounces five times, 
and the light actually crosses one another, another, which is one of the reasons you need great precision in manufacturing a roof prism compared to the more simple design of a pearl prism. Spotting scopes, you've got two different, again, industrial designs. You have angled models, you have straight models. And if we look at the components there, it's the same pretty much as a binocular with one barrel in a lot of ways. You've got an objective lens cell, you've got a focus wheel, or in the case of some of our higher end COA models, a dual focus system with a coarse focus and a fine focus. You've got your tripod mount on the bottom, also known as a foot, and the eyepiece. Eyepieces generally on the spotting scopes are generally exchangeable. You can interchange them and change eyepieces. I uh, get different powers of magnification in the thing as well, which is different than a binocular. Angled view um, is our best seller. Uh, they tend to be more vibration resistant because the fact that you generally have them lower, you don't need to have them as high uh, because it's a lot easier just to bow at the waist or bow your head down to look through the angled eyepiece. Um, so you can have a smaller and lighter weight tripod with one of these. They also uh, have superior um, ergonomics if you're going to be sharing with people different heights uh, on a straight through model um, even though it's a little more easy to understand from the standpoint it seems a little more intuitive to be looking in the same direction as your objective lens is pointing um, it's harder for a taller person to get behind a lower straight scope so that's one of the disadvantages um, a major advantage of the straight through models, it's a little easier to locate your subject and uh, it works a lot better on a window mount if you're gonna be using it from your car. So advantage, disadvantage. So let's talk about some binocular basics and in particular I wanna talk about specifications real quick and then we're gonna open it up after that section again to the Q&A and get to your questions. So just so everyone understands, we're gonna talk about uh, the nomenclature of a binocular. And the nomenclature is basically the naming. If we were to look at this particular product, it's a COA brand product. The model would be the BD42-8XD, but it's an eight by 42 binocular. So let's look at the 842. Uh, as you might expect, the first part, 8X, deals with the magnification. And uh, it means that you're gonna magnify, this binocular will magnify your subject eight times. You can think of it in two ways. You can say it's gonna make the subject appear eight times closer, or you can say it's gonna make the subject appear eight times larger, both are accurate to say. The second number, the 42, is the objective lens diameter in millimeters. All right, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about that and what it means to you. Um, one thing about this is uh, that you need to understand is your power of magnification and the objective lens are going to affect exit pupil. And the exit pupil is the circle of light you see when you look through a binocular or a spotting scope. Um, the size of that will be a direct relation to the power of magnification and the diameter of that lens. So in the example we just looked at, an 842 is an example, has a 42 millimeter, we're starting with a 42 millimeter wide circle of light. But in an optic, uh, anytime you increase the power of magnification, you decrease the circle of light by the exact same factor. So we know that every 842 will have the same exit pupil because we can take 42 millimeters, we can divide it by eight, and it's gonna be about a 5.25 millimeter wide circle of light, uh, which you can see here is similarly, this is the genesis that I'm showing here, the eight and a half by 44, but it has a 5.2 millimeter exit pupil, okay? Now that's important for one main reason, and that's you want to have all the cones in your, your uh, uh, rods, excuse me, in your eye, filled so that you get the maximum use out of any optic. But this is part of the reason why we have to uh, create so many different sizes, types of binoculars, is that you have to balance um, the most optical performance with how easily can I handhold or carry these throughout the day. So you're, um, in some cases, you are sacrificing pure optical performance um, for the size and weight and comfort, and you're having to balance those two. Here's some kind of graphic examples, which I hope you can see. Uh, these are all eight power binoculars in the exact same line. These are our BD binoculars. Um, we've got an 842 on the bottom, an 832 in the middle, and an eight by 25 at, at the top. 
And as you can see, as you go from top to bottom, um, they get smaller and they're lighter weight naturally, but you're sacrificing um, a bit of light entering your eye as you decrease the size of the objective lens. Okay, and hopefully that makes sense. And you can see the circles of light hopefully coming out of each of those. It was hard to kind of capture that, but that's the 42 on the bottom, the 5.25 millimeter circle of light. You've got four millimeter wide circle of light coming out of the one in the middle, and at top just 3.1 millimeters, which is a little small. Compacts are great to be able to have something that you can put in your pocket all the time, but a little difficult. Um, sometimes optically you're giving up some to be able to have that portability. Okay, here's another example. This is our BD2 line, and I've got two different models here. They're the exact same um, objective lens size, but different power. So similarly, as you increase power of magnification, a few things are gonna happen. You're getting less light to your eye as you increase magnification. The other thing is not only are you magnifying your subject, but you are indeed magnifying any movement in your system. Um, so that means um, any shake that you have, handshake is gonna be increased as you increase power magnification. And I'll be quite honest with you, that's a, there's a point of diminishing returns with each individual user. But I've always found personally that I can't really handle 10 power as effectively as I can eights and even sevens um, because I shake a lot. So that's something to consider as well when you're selecting an optic. There's a couple other specifications that are out there and I'm gonna tell you right now, if you understand exit pupil, these are really kind of meaningless. And let me explain why. Uh, you've got relative brightness index and twilight factor. In essence, these two um, specifications are nothing more than a different way of expressing exit pupil. So if you understand what an exit pupil is and that a larger circle of light is advantageous, uh, you really don't need these two or they, they don't mean much. And I'll explain why. Relative brightness, if we look at it, is literally we're taking the exit pupil and we're squaring it to make it more dramatic. That's all it is. So if you have a 4.1 millimeter exit pupil, as in this example, you square it, it's 16.8 relative brightness index or RBI. So it's just another way and it seems more dramatic the differences when you do that. Twilight factor similarly is again, another mathematical formula uh, in which you are um, utilizing the power magnification and the size of the objective. However, these are, these and other you know, similar specifications that are based purely on mathematical formulas, they don't take into account um, the quality of glass that are in each binocular uh, or the lens coatings that are on there to deliver light more effectively. So in that way, the cheapest optic and the most expensive optic, if they have the same nomenclature, if they're both 842s, will have the exact same exit pupil, the exact same relative brightness index, the exact same twilight factor, even though if you were to look through the two, the more expensive binoculars clearly gonna appear a lot brighter. So these are a little bit misleading, and I think that's important to understand that you don't wanna make sweeping judgments based on the written specifications alone because of some of these reasons. Field of view is another important specification. Um, we have two different types of field of view that are often used. There's linear field of view and there's angular field of view. Um, all of the Asian manufacturers in particular typically will list the angular field of view. Um, you can see it, we'll go back and look on um, one of the COA products, it's right uh, next to the nomenclature. How many degrees wide is the field that you can see? But in linear field of view, depending on which side of the pond you're on, and by the pond, I mean the Atlantic, um, in the US, this is expressed at a distance of 1,000 yards away from you where you are standing, how wide is the picture you can see from one side to the other in feet? So in the US, we express linear field of view at feet at 1,000 yards. Um, and in Europe, generally, it's how many meters wide is that picture at 1,000 meters distant, okay? There is a constant to be able to uh, convert back and forth if you cared about that, but it really doesn't do much for us. Here's sort of a graphic example showing um, different fields of view. And this is uh, a graphic for our BD2XD line, which is actually characterized as an extremely wide field of view binocular line. But you can see the narrow field of view at left and the wider field of view on the right side. And you can see the difference. Um, with a narrow field of view, you're gonna have a harder time finding subjects because 
you know, you don't have as much picture from side to side. Okay. Now this graphic also kind of points to something else. Um, if you look at on the first two, our 32 millimeter models, then we have two 42 millimeter models. As you increase magnification, the other thing that happens is your field of view will shrink because as you increase the zoom, if you will, or you increase the, the power, just like if you're looking through a zoom lens, you can see less from side to side through the same series of lenses. So um, you can see as the six and a half has an incredible 10 degree field, it's 175 meters at 1000 meters. When you go to eight power, it drops. Uh, and then at the bottom, there's actually a 10 power 32, which is the smallest field of view in the, in the range. So that's the other thing. As you increase magnification, your subject will get um, harder to hold still. Uh, you get less light reaching your eye and your field of view will decrease. Here's another graphic example through my spotting scope, just looking at my bird feeder before I've filled it. They're full now, but uh, it is at 25 power uh, of magnification digiscope at the top and then 50 power at the bottom. So you can see again how you can see less from side to side. This is a graphic representation. One of the uh, last specifications that we're going to deal with here is uh, interpupillary distance. And this is a range um, of two measurements. It's how far apart or how close together can those two circles of light, the exit pupil, be based on the mechanics of the hinge mechanism and the chassis. And we just want to make sure that uh, in most cases, um, that's not a problem unless you are outside of the range of the typical spacing in eyes or it's important maybe for children but if you have to very narrow set eyes um, or very wide set eyes you may have difficulties finding a binocular that you can get a full picture through okay and that's why that's important eye relief this is another one that's a little bit tricky um, it is the distance the ideal distance how far away can the lens in your eye be from the lens in the optic be it a binocular or a spotting scope uh, where you can still see the full field of view. With any optical product, say a binocular or anything else, if you put them up against your eye, um, and if you have the eye cups rolled down and you mash them right up against your eye, very often you get too close, you'll see sort of blackened arcs. Um, they can be like semicircular arcs or moon-shaped arcs that you can see um, in the optic. As you pull it away, it'll get a really nice view. And then as you pull it away even further, you'll start to see that the field of view will shrink until you are left with just the small circles of light coming out the back side. All right, so that's what eye relief is about. That's what your um, rotating eye cups are for to be able to adjust that so that you can have your eye at the proper distance away from the eyepiece. Now eye relief is another one that as a specification, you don't wanna put a lot of bearing in uh, and it's very difficult. Um, to uh, compare across brands on the written specifications like this. Like I say, the first ones are because they're based on mathematical models and they don't take into account um, the quality of glass and coating, so it doesn't tell you much. The other thing is these measured specifications, there's no agreed upon standard on the proper way to measure eye relief. And it seems some manufacturers may um, use this, like this example shows, from the middle or the center of the outer objective lens to the outside of the eye. Other people, other manufacturers who do the shortest distance from the highest point of the curve to the highest point of the curve. Um, and you know that can result in a difference of sometimes as dramatic as two millimeters or more um, between what one manufacturer may represent the exact same eye relief in. And I've seen many cases where people said, I've tried brand X um, and it didn't work for me because it was a 15 millimeter um, eye relief, so I didn't try your brand because you know I know it's not going to work based on the written spec. But when I encourage them to try that, they find lo and behold that it does work because we have a different way of measuring. So again, bear that in mind. You want to be an informed consumer when you go to make these decisions and not spend too much time dwelling on the written specifications. And you can't unfortunately use them uh, very effectively to compare cross brand either. You're really only effective within one manufacturer's line. Okay, close focus, one of the last ones we're gonna talk about is, as the name implies, how close can you um, focus um, your binocular? How close can you be to your subject and still get it in focus? Uh, this one varies a little bit because it's not a standard. Um, older eyes 
with the exact same pair of binoculars as an example um, are going to generally not be able to uh, focus as closely as say a child would with the exact same pair of binoculars. And it's related to that same effect as when we get older, our arms tend to get longer and we you know, find we need bifocals and reading glasses and things of that nature. Um, it's the same effect. So these are estimations. Generally, most manufacturers are going to um, give an estimation that's repeatable by most users, but not always. So you have to bear that in mind as well and try it yourself. Okay. Uh, the BD2, I put again because that's our newest line of binoculars and they have by far the best um, uh, close focus, you know, for the butterflies and odes folks, our 32 millimeter BD2s are extremely popular right now because you can focus to basically your knees if you're a taller person, but everyone can focus at least to their feet at 4.1.3 uh, meters or four, just over four feet. Um, focus distance. Chromatic aberration, something I talked about in the beginning, it is a prismatic separation of the light and when you see it manifested in the field, um, it looks like the example on the right where you can see sort of a purplish ghosting on one side and a greenish ghosting on the other side because the, the light's being spread apart in a prismatic effect. You can see in the lower graphics, um, a normal lens, how that separates. And you've all seen that. You put a piece of glass uh, or a prism and the rainbow will show up on, on a wall or whatever behind there. Um, fluoride is an element and, and use of our fluoride glass blanks is one of the best um, components to uh, be able to put those light waves back together and eliminate or at least greatly reduce chromatic aberration. Um, and then finally, I wanna talk about waterproof, fog proof. So waterproofing, again, um, it seems like every binocular from $50 to $3,000 um, and beyond is waterproof anymore. And part of the reason for that, again, is the lack of specifications in the optics industry. There's not a single written um, measurable, um, uh, what am I trying to say, um, measure that you need to meet to call your product waterproof, really. So it can mean nothing or something. So you have to, again, buyer beware. You wanna know how waterproof is a binocular and ask around how well do these hold up. Some manufacturers do list a measurable specification to answer that question, but that's important. And then when you see fog proof in the industry, that is just um, another, it doesn't mean that when you go from a, the air conditioning out into the hot, humid, humid environment, say in the tropics, that the outer surfaces um, of your lens aren't gonna have condensation or from my friend like Jared Clark and others in the great white north, when you go out of the heat and go out into um, a cold, damp environment that you're not gonna get condensation on the outer surfaces. That's gonna happen regardless. That has more to do with until the, um, the temperature difference on that cold lens um, gets more in line with the ambient temperature outside, that's gonna disappear. When in optics, when we say fog proof, what we mean is that the internal barrels are filled with um, a gas, usually nitrogen, uh, one of the noble gases that helps to prevent um, moisture, water vapor from occurring inside the internal uh, barrels. All right, I think, yeah, I thought so. That is the end of um, optics basics. And I wanna now open it up if we can to some of the questions, um, Q&A section. I don't know if we've got any questions from anybody. Feel free and ask uh, on what we've just talked about if you have any, any questions on that. Or even if not that, um, the questions you want to answer. I know a lot of people are interested in digiscoping in particular. Um, and just so you know, we are gonna do a separate webinar just on digiscoping, but I wanted to make sure we started more simplistically at the beginning here um, because one of the things that we're noticing through this, you know, whole pandemic that is occurring right now is a lot of people are moving to the field, uh, often for the first time and going out as families, um, and enjoying nature together. And, uh, it's something that I've seen more and more happily in Florida where I live. Um, I'm in an area that's not completely closed down and we're still able to go out to the parks and things so long as you maintain your social distancing. But um, I've seen a lot of 
families, it seems like, that are maybe running away from the constant barrage of news that we're getting and turning to nature for probably maybe the first time. They don't have an optic out there. We've been getting a lot of questions on, you know, what optic should I select? So I wanted to start here and apologies to anyone that uh, if this wasn't what you were expecting, but we have the opportunity now um, to uh, turn to questions. And there should be, you should notice there's a question and answer um, section on the bottom. If we don't have any questions, we'll open up to the panel and let you guys um, speak. Paul, would you like to uh, talk about anything from the UK? Add any uh, just optics basics, talk about your favorite uh, spotting scope. I mean, I've got a more PowerPoint that we can move to, but. Um, if you're yeah, can, you hear me? can everybody hear me? Just that Welcome, second. Paul Hackett from the UK, one of our supreme developers. <laughs> okay. So, Jeff, the the one thing that we have a vast difference uh, between our two places across the pond is light. Mm -hmm. We, as the Brits over here, we we struggle for our light. So, I I normally typically say when I'm doing my workshops, Florida sun or Barcelona sun where there's quite a lot of it through the, through the year, which then brings on other factors when you're doing digiscoping. So, for example, my choice of weapon, the old 884 scope, obviously with this. Um, phone scoping, yes, I'm an all-rounder, I do all of that, but I kind to, this is my weapon of choice at the moment. I've used this since 2017. Um, primarily, I'm also a Panasonic ambassador as well. Um, but this is the Panasonic G9, coupled with a 20 millimeter pancake lens and with the trusted uh, DA10 Cower adapter. So a lot of people, when they see some things like this, Jeff, what I find is there's a kind of mystery to it. But with the help of Rob Wilton, one of our guys and myself and other people, we put quite a few videos up, which tries to debunk the myth about it's complicated or it's not easy. And the biggest thing I find is, is where people try to compare digiscoping to conventional photography. Uh, Mr. Wilton, mm. do, you get, do you, get, you get that? Mr. Wilson, do you get that? Where people try and compare the methods of how to take pictures. And so the biggest thing I do find, Jeff, is one of the biggest things is, when you've got a photographer who wants to go to digiscoping. Right. So what I try and say is quickly is that leave the conventional photography there and take it in that there are limits with digiscoping yeah. because we've got that little magic finger, which is our focus, not the autofocus. That's the biggest one for me that I find. Um, and also, so quickly just going back a little bit to some things. So, People say to me, well, how does this work? How, how can you connect it all? So let's just break it down literally to show you, okay? So that's the zoom eyepiece, the 25 to 60 magnification, okay? This would normally have um, an eye cup. So to connect said camera, I attach onto the thread, Aguchi san our director of optics, who is our uh, creator of most of these amazing pieces of equipment has had the foresight to put all these threads in which is brilliant on some of the eyepieces on the scopes so that's one half of the adapter the second half of the adapter is there so it's basically it's just basically join it together and then with the adapter ring you can just tie it up which means you can take it in portrait or landscape so for me let's just break this down a little bit more so how, what is, what is this? So this is one method. I think somebody was asking about two different methods about using the, the adapter, the, the cow adapter. Um, yeah. And just what are the major differences. Well, for me, there's more magnification. If we're going a little bit deep here, there's more magnification with the cow adapter than there is this. Cause this has now got, if I take this off, he says, yeah, I won't take it off. So that's, there is a 20 millimeter pancake lens. You can see inside there's a glass. And then with a thread, filter thread there, that goes down from that down to the diameter of the lens. And that attaches there. 
So, Rob, Rob Wilton, have you got a the other adapter there with you, possibly, just so you can snap in and come into the camera? If you just hold it back. You're talking up about the PA seven. Yes, sir, the PA seven. PA7. There you go, Jeff. Yeah. We are all together on this page. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. So, yeah. for me, the questions are: what What's best for me? Now, for me, Jeff's got there. Rob's got there. I've got this. Um, primarily for me. There's more magnification with the cower. Um, and also, because we're using people, we're using a micro four thirds camera, the crop factor is two times. So let's break that down a little bit. In the beginning was a camera, a full frame camera, one to one magnification. And then you've got your DSLR, DSLR cameras with a CMOS sensor, one. 0.6 times so when you put it this put the camera onto the scope it started off at one to one then with this cmos sensor and the dslr cameras 1.6 times magnification whatever scope you're using and now with the micro four thirds it's giving you two times so the magnification is big yes. so from 25 to 60 that um, well, with, the P, with the pa7 connected to a micro four thirds your minimum is 2,000 millimetres, and that takes some serious control. To control 2,000 mil, um, you know, you're going to need <laughs> no wind, good light. So, yeah, that's what that, the PA7 is ideally suited for full frame cameras, 1,000 millimetre. Yeah, that's what I was trying to get to. So, going back to what I was trying to say, with, with this kind of setup, um, I remember because I've been digiscoping now. 21 years I was one of the first people in the UK to take it up and we started off with crazy things you would not believe the equipment I used to have um, an old old high 8 millimeter camcorder attached to a scope and basically if I because the magnification was so big I ended up like calling me Billy no mates I went with my friends to see a rare bird I could just get the head in I had to go back the next field just to get the whole bird in so we have advanced so much. And now with the cower stuff, because the biggest thing for me is why cower? Um, it's the glass. The glass is king or queen. The glass is king. Okay? You cannot get away from the fact that if you've got a good piece of glass, two things happen. The sharpness of the, of the, of the image and also the reduction of chromatic aberration, CR, colour fringing. And I can confidently say this, that amongst all the scopes that I've ever looked through, and I've had now 20 odd years in the optics business, the Kawa still has the least amount of chromatic aberration. I'm just going to just, just show, show you something. Go on, stick, go on, that's, go on, what, that's what we're talking about right there. That, that, that is a piece of solid fluorite crystal, and it's very it's heavy. Great. It's really heavy. So that's not okay. glass, that is a solid piece of fluorite grown and then it'll be cut and carved. And let me, just, let me see if I can just find you the lens. And how, how, it, how, how, it's, how it's cut down as well, Rob, isn't it? The size of it, how it's cut down to. Yeah, so that's the finished result. There's your disc, solid fluorite crystal grown and then that's the finished polished lens. So that, we're the only manufacturer that uses pure fluorite crystal. That's our unique difference. It, it, yeah, it makes a big difference. And, and, you know, just, you know, we can say it all day long. So we, we work for the company, but, uh, you know, Paul, you're, uh, you actually are an ambassador. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, I, you could turn to a third party as well. You know, recently, just here in the U.S., the National Audubon Society did their big review recently of um, their buying guide for the, optics and they selected the TSN 883 by Koa as the best performing spotting scope that there is. Uh, everyone was in that, that, and you can check it out yourself. Uh, our 550, which also uses the fluoride, was the best performing um, compact scope. So yeah, we know uh, there's a lot of that out there and it's not just from us. We've got a few other questions and, and yeah. all uh, hack it um, to get back just quickly 
one person's asked each panelist, what is your preferred method of digiscoping? And I think we're going to get a lot of different answers here. So uh, you will start with you, Paul. What's your, which, which method do you prefer the most? Um, I, pref I prefer the camera, mm -hmm. um, but um, because I like the phone and I've spent a lot of time studying the phone scoping to perfect it. I like both, to be honest. I like both. And then if you break it down again, do a yeah. preferred video or stills. I like both because people like Simon, our Simon Brumby, who is an absolute genius. He's on out there. Maybe we'll get his opinion too. Yeah, let's get his opinion. Wave or send yeah. some on chat, Simon, if you want us to activate your mic. If the, you're the, 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 the nice thing about color is though, is, I mean, I, I, I love digiscoping as well, but this, this one adapter here mm -hmm. can be modified to work with anything. So I can use a, a body only. I can use it with a, a, a 50 mil lens attached. I can even put one of our rings on and attach it to a smartphone adapter. Yeah. That's, that's what I love about those digiscoping setup. It's just so versatile. Sounds good. And, and it gives you all the, uh, and all the lens as well, really, to yeah. be honest with you. You know, um, for me, is there any questions there, Jeff? I can't. We got I, this, if they go to Q&A, there's, no. Let me get Robert Wilson involved. Robert Wilson, will you want to bring your mic uh, your, um, and speak to this as to which you prefer? It looks like Simon will, he is here, so we're going to activate his mic in the interim too. Uh, but yeah, Robert, why don't you chime in and I'll bring Simon Rumby from the Netherlands on. Go ahead. Yeah, can you hear me, Jeff? Yeah, yeah we got you. Yeah, it's a, it's a funny question for me because, as you know, I was a staff photographer for Lockheed Martin for 30 years and swore I would never use a phone as a capture device right and, and I I love them both I'm addicted to them both but I, I'm just really surprised um, that I now recommend to so many people you know especially because birders don't have a lot of experience with cameras a lot of them and um, and the phone is just so simple and it's and it's and the quality you, you know you can't blow a a phone image up very large, um, it starts to fall apart because of the sensor size, but the video quality uh, from the phone um, is phenomenal. And as you know, I've, I've got broadcast quality video, phone scope video from, from the iPhone that I use and the 883 that I prefer of all the coescopes um, in a broadcast quality PBS production on a uh, documentary here in the US. So, you know, phone scope bird video B-roll was included in that. And to me, it just blows my mind, you know, being in the photo industry so long. So like them both, but the, the phone, you know, I recommend to so many people start with your phone even a lot of the professional photographers that i've converted and in, interested in scopes now um i tell them you know start with that phone and just perfect it and start to realize the power of the scope and enjoy it and then if you want to take it further um you know go the route with the with the da10 um adapter and uh that's that's kind of kind of my take on it so all right, so now we're going to go to the other extreme. Simon, can hey. you hear us now? Are you here? Yeah, I'm here. Perfect. Hey. Welcome, Simon. Hi, Simon. Good to talk to you, Thanks. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so uh, I, I, before I started as an ambassador for Kawa, I bought Kawa products with my own hard earned money and uh, was spamming some of the things that I did on Facebook and such forth. Uh, and that's how I met Paul uh, one year and got into being uh, the ambassador program with uh, with you guys. Uh, so I'm very fortunate in that respect. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm really into my video. I really, really love my video. I think the whole uh, process of creating uh, media for publishing and that you can potentially sell, uh, I think it's fantastic. I, uh, and the fact that you can use a telescope for that gives you the the huge millimeters that people were talking about you know you're starting off at a thousand millimeters going all the way up to three and a half thousand millimeters uh, it's a hugely versatile tool and it's something that a lot of nature enthusiasts and lovers have access to you know i don't well, every bird has got a scope right so it just was uh, logical to um 
set some equipment behind it and start you know recording things and, and doing stuff with it uh, I, I was really really skeptical about um, using mobile phones and I'm very very unskeptical <laughs> skeptical about using mobile phones now I think um, uh, for the same reason that everybody uh, is everybody has a scope everybody's got these mobile mobile devices now and um, with uh, good um, apps you can set shutter angle and things like that um, and using the cower uh, range of adapters so the da10s and so forth you can actually put neutral density filters in between them so you can set correct shutter angle uh, and there's no other uh, system on the market that allows you to do that it, it, if you want to do it and you want to create the highest quality stuff highest qu quality images and, and footage that you can with relative with equipment you've got then cow is the way forward with that it, uh, it's uh, yeah it's fantastic so yeah agreed and, and that's one thing i mentioned right at the beginning you know um that we have the greatest uh, suite of accessories and adapters of any manufacturer anywhere we really kind of can accommodate all the, the various things um we're going to move to another question and rob wilton this may be one that you know off the top of your head uh, we were being asked um does the da10 um have a rubber bumper to protect glasses when the camera is not attached uh it it, it it doesn't have a rubber it, it it's got a slightly soft edge there a right. little bit of padding there, but um, that it has been taken into account a little bit, but it's yeah. not rubber. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But the, the mounting collar has uh, rubber on it on the inside, so when you screw your eyepiece off the, and you attach the collar, the inside of that collar has a, a rubber. Yeah, there's, there's a little just there. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Perfect. There. Okay, so that's that one. Uh, we've got another question here. Um, does one or the other system make it easier to switch back and forth between digiscoping and general spotting scope? Um, I think that we make them all pretty simple, be it the DA-10, the, um, our digiscoping adapters for phones, um, and the PA-7, you know, they're, they're yeah. literally just um, one set screw pretty much. Or, or one screw. grub screw. Yeah. And then on and off. On and on. Yeah. So, um, they're really well thought out and and we're a we're a tough crowd we're going to let people know right away if it doesn't work very well um let's see what other questions we have here there's a, there's a nice one about um binoculars for a nice family friendly binocular which is really good but you know especially this you know what's going on we're all in the gardens um i guess my recommendation for that would be the yfs really because yeah. You know, they're nice, very easy to use, power of prism, they've got a nice wide field of view, big focus wheel. I mean, they're about as family friendly as it gets. Yeah. And, and the YF2, let's not forget too, is specially designed to accommodate very narrow interpupillary distance, as you remember, right? So it's great for small hands and in very close set eyes for, for children in particular. Uh, they retail here in the US, at least under $100, just under. Um, but we also have, that's a Poro Prism. Uh, we also have our very popular model for those that want something a little better performer with better glass. We've got our BD2 line and our SV line that sits between that as, a, uh, as our entry level roof design as well. Uh, both. Jeff? Yes. The, quick, uh, sir. Quick, sorry, Jeff, quick question. Yes. How many levels of binocular do Cowler actually sell now? We're at four. I've actually got a slide I could show that, but I mean, not including the Highlander, uh, which is sort of a hybrid, um, that classifies binocular, but we've got our YF line, we've got our SV line, we've got our BD2 line, and then finally, uh, the Genesis line is our pinnacle, uh, utilizing our XD permanent glass um, on that. And that's my binoculars cho yeah. choice. That's eight my bird. Eight by 33. Eight by thirty threes. Eight and a half by forty four. Yeah, yeah, these. I like them these big. Are, these are ten years old, and have not had been in. And I think that's another uh, sign of the quality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think going through. This is at year eleven now. Year eleven. Look pretty good. Yeah. Man, yeah. and, I, and I have used them. I'm a birder, as you well know, Jeff. I'm a birder. Yeah. Well, you've got this. There's, there's four with a white cloth. How much? Yeah. Um, 
dirt is is on your hands you know if you you, you wash them every couple of months it's amazing what's on on the on the rubber yeah. armory I don't uh, talk about that during the COVID thing. We can't even talk about that. <laughs> as far as reducing chromatic aberration, the, the, the genesis on it, there's four XD lenses in each model, isn't there? Mm -hmm. and it's just, just phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. Genesis. And we have, you know, one of the things, we're, we're, we're running up on time here, but just to remind people, um, if you have any further questions, obviously feel free to reach out to us in our customer service lines. Um, do check out the videos. Rob here, who's on screen, is the genius who produces most of our corporate videos, the ones that look like something. If they look like an idiot holding his phone in the field, it's me. Uh, <laughs> but but if, it, if it looks nice and polished, Rob Wilton is the man. But we've got over 100 and I think 107 videos now on our YouTube channel um, on a whole suite of topics. Um, and we'd love to find out from you, um, you know, what else you'd like to hear about to that I do have quickly, um, I'm gonna launch a poll. Um, and then basically it's, it's something I just wondering uh, of the topics above, if you have any specific topics that you'd like to see. We're gonna be moving forward with these webinars. We do a lot more of them. We're trying to do them weekly if we can. Uh, obviously digiscoping is the next one we've got um, lined up, but, but to start off, we want to keep it a little simpler because digiscoping, we're gonna try and do some experimentation and see how easily we can actually digiscope and show you um, processes and things. So we need another week on that one. Plus we'd like to get some of our other um, ambassadors involved in that. But uh, yeah, we've got a, a lot of different topics. So um, to cover and want to know what you're interested in as not surprisingly, digiscoping's shown up as the number one um, topic and we're gonna, I think hopefully get that going next Saturday. So bookmark that and look for the, uh, the announcement on our uh, social media pages. Um, I'm gonna end the polling there. Looks like we got everyone's in. We'll share the results, boom. There you <laughs> <Did get> you <laughs> scope it. <laughs> that's the yeah. clear cut winner and, and not surprising. And that's exactly what we'd already had planned for next week. Um, I guess with that, I'd like to thank you all. Thank the folks that came out. Jared Clark was out there. I didn't get a chance to talk to him. Uh, we're going to do a, a future webinar with Jared you know, from Newfoundland. Um, as him as the, the main panelist. Um, um, and others, Simon, uh, good to hear from you. I think that's the first time we've ever kind of spoken, maybe. Just uh, we've been bouncing back and forth on social media. Um, Jim Eager out there, a real avid digiscoper that I know well. Uh, maybe see something from him in the near future. Um, thanks again for showing up, everyone that did on this first uh, flash in the pan here um, in our first webinar series. Again, uh, first in our webinar series, excuse me. And, and thanks again, my friend Luis Glaes. We're already roommates but that's another story at any rate um i think we got all the questions i appreciate you all coming by and with that we'll end um our webinar and again thank you to all the panelists thank you uh to all of our participants from nine different countries that came in a great turnout for our especially our first um first go around here so thanks again and we'll be talking to you enjoy your time in the field and, and stay safe out there everybody